Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to LNET's Monday afternoon briefing. I am Mark Sachs. I am LNET Southeast Regional Director. It's a pleasure to, uh, to host today's briefing, uh, to moderate it. And today I am also honored to, to moderate a discussion with our very own Emmanuel Navon. Um, in addition to serving as CEO of, of LNET Israel, Emmanuel is an adjunct professor of international relations at Tel Aviv University. It's a senior fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, JISS, and an international affairs analyst for I-24 News. I think today is going to be a heartfelt and meaningful uh, discussion with Emmanuel. Certainly, we understand the uh, uh, what's going on around the globe, uh, particularly with respect to, to Israel and, and, and involving anti-Semitism. But we also know that yesterday was Yom Hazikaron, and today is Yom Hatzmut the juxtaposition of a day of, of mourning and pain for those who fought for Israel's independence, followed by today, which is a day of enthusiasm, op optimism for those who are um, thrilled to live in an independent nation, uh, state of Israel. And with that, Emmanuel, I'd like to get your thoughts, as I think we are all thinking, the mood right now in Israel and how is everybody dealing with that juxtaposition, juxtaposition of the of the pain and anguish, not only of the last 80 years, but of the last seven months, um, and perhaps with the optimism uh, that people can look forward to? So first of all, uh, hello to everybody, and thank you for uh, having me uh, today. As you mentioned, Mark, uh, we are, I mean, literally right now in Israel, uh, it is now uh, shortly after 7 p.m., and uh, it's about uh, sunset. Uh, have in front of me, uh, you know, I have a window in front of me in my office, and we're really, literally transitioning right now between uh, Yom Hazikaron, the Day of Remembrance, and Yom Atzma'ud, the Day of Independence. So we physically feel this transition uh, between two extreme, uh, one extreme of sadness and one of uh, of happiness. Uh, and I think that you know when our founding fathers decided. Uh, to uh, to have uh, Yom Atzmaut right after Yom Azikaron, I think it was a very a very powerful message. Right now in Israel, of course, this year, uh, those two days are uh, you feel a very heavy atmosphere because, of course, we are commemorating Yom Azikaron and about to celebrate Yom Atzmaut uh, in a time of war, which is in fact the first time in Israel's history that we are. Uh, commemorating uh, those two days uh, within uh, as we're at war and of course a war that has cost us dearly and continues to cost us dearly uh, because more than a thousand and five hundred families in Israel uh, ha are added to the list of mourning families uh, who've lost uh, dear ones uh, either in the uh, horrific terrorist attacks of so October 7 or soldiers that have been fighting uh, on October 7 and since then in Gaza uh, to, uh, to fight Hamas and restore uh, security in Israel's southern border and hopefully also in the northern border. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think there's any of us here in Israel who does not, who is not familiar, who doesn't know uh, a family, a friend, a neighbor who's lost someone since, uh, since October 7. Uh, I can tell you on a personal note that, uh, you know, uh, like uh, many Israelis, like most Israelis, uh, my son has been fighting uh, since October 7, <clears throat> one of them as an officer in Gaza. And uh, today, uh, basically, he spent his whole day, uh, you know, going to cemeteries and visiting parents uh, because uh, those kids who fell during the war, some of them are his friends, some of them his soldiers. So... It is very sad, but on the other hand, uh, our youth is also very aware of the reason why it is fighting. Uh, what it is, what is amazing about Israel's uh, young men and women is that they have a very acute sense of history, and they're perfectly aware uh, of what they're fighting for. You know, it's uh, those young people uh, know how to uh, enjoy life. Uh, they know how to have a meaningful life, but they also know how to sacrifice themselves for a higher cause, the independence and the freedom of Israel. 
and they know that when they go on the battlefield, they carry on their shoulders more than 3,000 years of history. And they're very aware of it. And I would add to that, that they're also very aware of the fact that they're not only fighting for Israel's uh, independence <clears throat> and freedom, uh, but also for the millions of Jews around the world. Uh, especially, I would say, uh, and I, when I discuss this with my son, it's very clear when they see what's happening on campuses in America, on cities in Europe, uh, they're saying that we're fighting for those Jews in America, in Europe, in the Western world, not in the Soviet Union or in Syria, but Jews in the free world who are being harassed and threatened because they're Jews on the university campuses, on the most beautiful cities of, of Europe. And, um, and that's why, as I said, uh, when we have this transition from Yom Ma'ut, from Yom Azikaron, sorry, to Yom Ma'ut, as I said, we're very much aware of the fact that there is a very heavy price to be paid for freedom and independence, but that we have to uh, we have to carry that struggle, as I said, not only for the state of Israel, but for the entire Jewish people. So, as I understand it, there's a conversation. Uh, taking place in Israel right now about the generations that exist between 1948 and 2024. They're called the founding generation, the generation of builders, and the generation of rebirth. And I think from what I understand, there's a renewed appreciation for that latter generation, given what they've gone through and how they have responded since the days or since October 7th. In the West, however, there have been a number of polls since October 7th. And these polls have showed that the majority of Americans, 18 to 29, would not fight for their country if asked to do so. And more than a third of British youth between 18 and 40 uh, would not fight for their country. You gave a speech in uh, Rome not too long ago, and I'd like to read an excerpt from it and have you respond. You wrote, Another bridge, a brilliant French mind, Raymond Aron, described Marxism as the opium of the intellectuals. Marxism has morphed into wokeism, but many intellectuals still need their opium. We must provide an alternative to that opium by rebuilding the pride of our youth in Western civilization. There are no better places to start from than Rome and Jerusalem. With that in mind, one, could you explain why you delivered that speech in Rome? And two, what lessons do you think Israel, and particularly the rebirth generation, can teach the rest of us in the West? So you're right. I Last week, uh, Elnet, uh, which as many of you know, may know, uh, you know, Elnet opened an office in, in Rome uh, this year, uh, you know, in early 20, I mean, early 2024. And last week, uh, we held our first a strategic dialogue in Italy with Elnet. Uh, as you know, Elnet brings uh, our two main activities are that we bring uh, a lot of uh, delegations, about 30 delegations, mostly of parliamentarians, of European parliamentarians to Israel every year, but we also hold uh, strategic dialogues between Israel and major European countries among decision makers and top think tanks. So we had our first strategic dialogue in, in Rome. And um, uh, it was held uh, together with the De Gasperi uh, Foundation. Uh, uh, De Gasperi was uh, one of the uh, uh, founders of the European uh, Economic Community uh, in Italy, a, a, a leading uh, Christian uh, politician in Italy. And I, what I said there uh, in Rome is that, first of all, I mentioned the fact that our dialogue took place on the 8th of May, which was symbolic because that marks the end of World War II uh, in Europe in 1945. And I mentioned the fact that um, during the war, during the Great War of uh, the Second World War, uh, Jews and Italians uh, fought together. It was the first time that there was a, uh, uh, a Jewish army, uh, uh, I mean, of Israeli Jews, or at the time they were called Palestinian Jews. Because as you know, during the First World War, there was a, a Jewish brigade, but that was made up of diaspora Jews that fought with the British. In the Second World War, there was a Jewish army 
within the British army that was made up of Jews from the British mandate. And there were sabras. And I said to the Italians, I said to them, that's why you called the Italian Hebrei, Hebrews. They spoke Hebrew. They grew up in the land of Israel. <clears throat> and they fought together with the Italian resistance to uh, uh, the Germans in Northern Italy. Uh, the, Jewish, uh, uh, the, the Jewish brigade was formed in, uh, in the summer of 1944, and it started fighting in Northern Italy in October 1944. And then the first time since Bar Kokhba that you had Jewish soldiers with a star, with a flag of what became the flag of Israel. And, um, and you know, I, I said to them, it's, it's, it's a paradox because 1800 years before, we fought against each other, the Romans and the Jews. And I said, you know, I, I like to look at history in a broader perspective. Uh, the Roman Empire is no longer around. And thankfully, the Jewish people is. Uh, but, of course, the Roman Empire uh, shaped and continues to influence uh, Western civilization. And this civilization, I explained last week in Rome, rests on two pillars, Rome and Jerusalem. Uh, because uh, Western civilization, civilization is the outcome of uh, Judaism and then Christianity, uh, but also of Greek uh, culture and thought, both of which were integrated and expanded by the Roman Empire. And, um, and this fusion of Judaism and Judeo-Christian values and of Greek science, philosophy, uh, and thinking produced together, especially after the uh, Renaissance and the Enlightenment, this uh, wonder, which is called Western civilization, uh, which is a wonder of uh, scientific innovation, of cultural richness, uh, and of political freedom. And it is this civilization today, which is under attack, both from within, by uh, postmodern academics, and from without, by radical uh, Islam. And uh, and this civilization is under attack. And what I said, my message in Rome last week is that we have to defend Western civilization from Rome and Jerusalem. Uh, and of course, I mentioned the fact that Rome and Jerusalem also happens to be uh, the title of a book published in, uh, in 1862 by the German Jewish philosopher Moses Hess, uh, who said basically already at the time that the Jews needed to reclaim the national component of their identity and to rebuild uh, their national home. And I also mentioned, I concluded in my, in my presentation that uh, you know, the, I was, I was talk, referring again about the, to the Jewish wars between Rome and, and the Jews uh, back in the first century. And I, I reminded my audience that in his book, The Jewish Wars, uh, Flavius Josephus tells the story of Emperor Titus after the destruction of Jerusalem, who was asked by the residents of Antiochus, of Antioch, to uh, expel the Jews. And, and, and Emperor Titus tells them, well, uh, where am I supposed to expel them? I just destroyed their country. Uh, and, and I mentioned the fact that this was said, those words were said 1,954 years ago. And, uh, and, and, and the Jews have not only survived this very long period, but they have rebuilt their country, which is a successful, free uh, country. And that is a source of uh, pride and inspiration to whoever wants to protect Western civilization and a source of uh, rage and hatred uh, to whoever wants to destroy it. You know, Living in Israel, you are, you're steeped in history. It's impossible to escape history. It's also impossible to hide from Jewish history, being a Jew. In the diaspora, however, it's very easy to distance yourself from your history, to distance yourself from any history. Um, at my Seder at, at Pesach, I said to a, a number of people there, um, I said, I thought there were probably a good many Jews who were sitting at a Seder, possibly for the first time in many years, if ever, as a result of a rekindling of their Jewishness, which came as a result of the brutal attack on October 7th and the ensuing 
vicious anti-Semitism, particularly in this country, that they thought either didn't exist or ignored. For years, there was a growing divide, I think, between diaspora Jews and Israeli Jews for any number of reasons. But I think that changed on October 7th. So I know predictions are hard, particularly about the future, as um, we've all heard that quip. But I'd like to get your thoughts on where you think diaspora Jews and Israelis go from here. What does that relationship look like? Well, first of all, I agree with you that, uh, you know, in recent years, there was a very clear and I, I think also widening divide uh, between uh, Israel and I would say diaspora Jews in America uh, because studies and demographics uh, point out to the fact that Israeli society, uh, I mean, Israelis in the majority uh, are very, you know, uh, proud of the country and you know the very the the birth rates are very high uh most israelis are very attached to jewish traditions even though even if they're not uh, religious uh and for them israel is very important uh and and many youngsters in america among jews are much more liberal much more much less interested in israel marry much later so you, you felt this divide but I think that October 7 and the outcome of October 7 in terms of anti-Semitism in America and this hatred of the Jews has awoken many Jews in America. Uh, it's a wake-up call. I think that a lot of Jews thought that, you know, uh, being uh, citizens of the, uh, the greatest democracy and uh, the freest country in the world, or one of the freest country in the world, uh, they were out of the woods. And, uh, and then they realized uh, what we read every year in the Agada, and you just mentioned the, the Seder of Pesach, it says, Bechol dor vedor, at every generation, there are those who try to destroy us. And those who uh, forget this or want to forget it, do it at their own expense. Because, you know, Jews in Germany uh, in, in the early 20th century and after World War I were convinced that you know, they, they lived in the America of the time, you know, the most, you know, powerful, uh, wealthy uh, democracy uh, in, in <coughs> Europe. They were at the top of science, et cetera, et cetera. They never thought that what happened in the 30s would happen to them. They, 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 this came as a huge shock to them. And, you know, there is, uh, I, I, I often quote, there is this verse in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, in, in, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, of those verses that describe the the curses that would come upon the Jewish people if they abandon the the, the covenant at Mount Sinai, and one of the curses is that when you're uh, scattered around the world, you will not find anywhere to put down your foot. And uh, one of the commentators that I very much like. It's Rama, who was a learned rabbi from Spain in the 15th century, says that this verse refers to the time when the Jews will try very hard to completely assimilate among the nations, to put down their foot in terms of becoming part of the other nation, but those nations won't let them. Uh, they won't let them because no matter how hard they will try to leave and look like non-Jews, the nations will not let them do that. And that is really the meaning of anti-Semitism, this hatred that always reminds Jews who they are, even when they try to forget it, even in the most, in the freest, uh, the most wealthy, and the most comfortable countries. You know, as you were describing what that commentator said, the first thing that came to mind was Eurovision, strangely enough. Um, if you had asked me a month ago if I knew about Eurovision, I would have said, I think I've heard of it. Um, not only am I aware of it now, but the world is paying attention to Eden Golan and or paid attention to Eden Golan and, and Eurovision. I'd like to read the list of countries that apparently supported overwhelmingly an Israeli um, for to win Eurovision. And that list includes Australia, Belgium, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Portugal, San Marino, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK, all gave Eden Golan, an Israeli, 
their highest points. I could use a little help squaring this circle. Um, what does it say about Europe's relationship with Israel, Israelis, and Jews, particularly given France and the UK and the US, which is not part of your vision, are experiencing the highest levels of anti-Semitism in decades, and I would say in the United States ever? How do we square that circle? So first of all, if you hadn't heard about Eurovision until now, you were missing out on anything because <laughs> the music there is really lousy. As you've probably uh, noticed, it's uh, the Eurovision is a project that was established shortly after World War II to try and bring brotherhood and, and, and peace uh, in Europe. And by the way, many very famous songs came out of the Eurovision, uh, including uh, the Italian Volare and the Israeli uh, mm -hmm. Oda Vinuchai. So very famous. So sometimes they have good songs, but the average is very lousy, I must say. But I think what happened in, in, in Eurovision this year is very telling about the divide that we're talking about uh, in Europe. Um, you know, you had the representative of uh, Ireland uh, who, uh, I don't know if you noticed, like she dresses like as a, really as a de devil, literally as a devil, yeah. uh, trying to look as horrible as, as she can, and she's doing a pretty good job. She hates Israel, like most of the Irish. It's uh, something about Ireland we can talk here about. You know, it's, it's a long topic, why the Irish hate Israel so much. But anyways, and, and you know, I, I, was meant, I was talking before about Western civilization. You know, in America, who is the academic that is, uh, of course, the most identified with this... Uh, obsessive attempt to uh, destroy and deconstruct Judeo-Christian values and Western civilization by developing theories that try to destroy the family unit. Of course, a Jew, obviously, it's always the, the case, it's uh, Judith Butler. And it's not a coincidence if uh, one of the main uh, sources of this uh, uh, deconstructionism of Judeo-Christian uh, uh, values and uh, uh, it's not a coincidence if Judith Butler has described Hamas as quote-unquote a progressive movement and October 7 as quote-unquote again an act of resistance because why is there a connection between those who try to deconstruct the West and Judeo-Christian values and the hatred of Israel because I come back to what I said before the West the two pillars of Western cultures are Rome and Jerusalem. If you want to undo the West, you have to target Jerusalem. And Israel, as I said, symbolizes the victory of the Jewish spirit and of Western civilization. And this drives people mad when they have an issue with that civilization. And, and this is exactly what has divided Western public opinion in America and in Europe. It's either you won't find anybody really who doesn't have an opinion or doesn't care about what's happening in Israel and about Israel. They either completely support Israel's right to defend itself and to defeat its enemies, or they have an obsession against Israel because this is related to their real agenda. And here, and that's also why you have this very bizarre alliance between radical Islam and wokeism, I mean, nothing, they have nothing in common, but they have one enemy in common, and that is Western civilization and its Jewish pillar, which is Israel. They're only fighting together because they have a common enemy. Even though everything separates them, you have atheism, and the denial of the existence of gender and women and men in wokeism, and you have the most conservative and it would say even reactionary ideology on the side of radical Islam. So they have nothing to do together. And of course, you really need to be a brainwashed and ignorant American student to wear at the same time an LGTB flag and a kafia. You know, they don't even understand and realize the irony and the contradiction because the, the only knowledge, so to speak, comes from TikTok. But of course, we know from history that the uh, 
the radical left always ends up being the useful idiots of radical Islam. And it happened in Iran, by the way, with the Islamic Revolution of 1979, because the opposition to the Shah, to the emperor in Iran, was made up of two groups, the Islamists and the communists. They fought together, and as soon as the Islamists won the revolution, they killed and got rid of the communists. So this is a phenomenon that keeps repeating itself. But of course, there is no shortage of useful idiots who are ready to volunteer again and again. And this is what we're seeing today uh, in the West. The people who wear a kafia uh, in Europe or in America thinking they're being cool uh, would have worn a war for their parents, uh, shirts with the image of Che Guevara 40 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's both sad and ironic that as Iranian women are risking their lives by removing their headscarves, uh, TikTok students in America and in Europe wear those scarves thinking they're being cool and they're supporting the most, the most violent, the most anti-democratic and the most illiberal movements and ideology in the terms of liberalism, a word which they don't even understand. So you mentioned or you referred to Bambi Thug. Bambi Thug is the Irish Eurovision right. star who's speaking out. Um, I think a lot of people like her probably represent a very loud, obnoxious, kind of evil minority. And I, you know, if we look at those who voted for for Eden Golan, they represent the silent majority. I mean, this is their way of saying. We believe in Israel. We stand with Jews, and we stand against everything that that is against both uh, both, both Israel and and Jews. What is Elnet doing to capture and to harness the power of the silent majority? So, first of all, you're right that there's a big discrepancy uh, between um, the opinion of the silent majority when it comes to Israel and Western values and a small but very loud minority. And by the way, this was also revealed by the results of the voting at the Eurovision because the popular, what we would call the popular vote, right? People who voted from their phone massively voted in favor of Eden Golan, but the jury made up of, you know, so-called professionals uh, voted against her. And one of them uh, even uh, said it openly. There was, I saw a post today, I think on Twitter of a judge from, uh, no way who said, yeah, of course I voted against uh, Eden Golan to protest uh, Israel and what he called the genocide. And then he said, he ended by saying free Palestine, right? So you, you have very a very loud minority that goes to those demonstrations across Europe, which are paid, by the way, mostly by Qatar. You hear them uh, among academics, professors, uh, journalists, uh, uh, but then the majority of people, and we know it from our polls, uh, opinion polls in Europe, you know, people who want to keep their their culture and the civilization in Europe instinctively understand that Israel's struggle is their struggle. And you know, we had an opinion poll uh, that that was uh, that was uh, organized by Elnet France a few months ago that showed very clearly that a majority of French people. Uh, support Israel's right to defend itself, uh, have a very big concerns about Islamic terrorism. And, and that's what the people we're working on at Elnet, because we know that, that they support Israel, but we need to, uh, you know, we, we need to bring them the information. We need to bring them to Israel for them to realize what Israel is really about. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that when we bring those parliamentarians and those opinion makers to Israel and when they come from the first time they're literally in shock they're literally in shock you know last week no two weeks ago before I went to uh, uh, before I went to uh, Rome uh, we hosted a delegation of uh, young German and British parliamentarians uh, so they were like in the 30s and 40s and they came to Israel for the first time and at dinner, I addressed the delegation. 
And I sat next to a gentleman who was from the Bundestag, from the German parliament. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was black, like he's African, like what you call in America, African-American, but of course he's not American. And I started talking to him, uh, you know, before I gave my talk, I chatted with him in German because I happened to know German. And, um, uh, and then uh, I said to him, well, where were you from originally before Germany? So I said, from Cameroon. So I said, oh, so you speak French. So we switched to French and then we spoke to in English. And then we we went to the same school. I mean, he went later than me because uh, in, in Paris. And, and then, you know, we, we had so much stuff in common. And then he was telling me like how amazed he was about the fact that Israel is such a diverse democracy with different ethnic groups and that is so different than from what they see in the media and i'm telling you when those people come to israel they are in total shock and when they come back to europe they fight our battle because they say to the, the so-called elites or the self-proclaimed elites that they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about you know they say you don't know what you're talking about first of all this genocide thing is nonsense Israel is a true democracy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because they've seen it by, by themselves. And of course, it doesn't mean that Israel is perfect. It's not. And it's perfectly defined to criticize Israel. Israelis do it all the time. But we're talking here about a, a, a coordinated campaign of defamation. And um, and that's why I think Elnet is doing such an important work. Because, you know, in America, you have APAC, and they do uh, also a great job when it comes to U.S. public opinion and to... Uh, political support for Israel, but in Europe, until Elmet was established, there was nothing there. And uh, of course, it's a big challenge because you have over 30 countries there, plus the institutions of the European Union, but we see the result. And, you know, just to give you two examples, when when Germany um, last year bought the, uh, uh, the uh, anti-missile system developed by the Israel aircraft industry. They did it two years after Elnet brought the delegation of German parliamentarians who came to Israel shortly after the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They saw the system and they decided to buy it. And now you have this military partnership between Israel and Germany, but also in terms of public opinion. A few months ago, the European Parliament passed a resolution that can, with a very large majority, that condition any ceasefire on the release, the immediate release, the immediate and unconditional release of all Israeli hostages and on the defeat of Hamas. Now, this resolution would never have been passed without the many years of work done by Elnet on those parliamentarians uh, that, that have literally turned them around as pro-Israeli, as being pro-Israel after visiting Israel, many of them a few times. Before I transition to another question, I'd like to invite everybody to send in or submit through chat a question you have that you'd like Emmanuel to respond to. So Emmanuel, let's turn to Rafa. Because Rafa seems to be the fulcrum around which levers are being pulled. There appears to be three camps. Um, positions. The first one is don't go in. Israel's bad. Israel's already committing genocide. They don't want you to go in because they want to harm Israel. There are those who say, let's go in, period, regardless of what happens. And then there's a third that says, you know what, we recognize that Israel needs to go in, but we have some concerns logistically about what takes place afterwards. Where does, where, where do you Ball, what is our thinking? What is Elnet's thinking on this? And, and how are we positioning these, these different camps and their positions? Well, first of all, Elnet does not take public stances on political issues because, you know, uh, we're here to um, defend Israel and strengthening relations between Israel and Europe, but we do not take uh, political positions uh, on, uh, you know, contentious issues. But on the issue of Rafa, <clears throat> I think it's, again, very clear when you see how people react to Israel's military operations. I mean, two days already after October 7, some people were calling for a ceasefire. Israel hadn't even started, you know, uh, 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 defending itself. 
and people were saying, oh, 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 ceasefire. Let's have, uh, let's have peace, right? And then when Israel started defending itself, they were saying, oh my God, you're making, you're, you're committing massacres. And of course, who brought the charge of genocide uh, at the, um, at the International Court of Justice, it was the same Cyril Ramaphosa, the African, the president of South Africa, who literally submitted the case of the Court of Justice. I mean, his government, right after he flew back from Qatar, having given been given instructions and money from Qatar to sue Israel at Israel at the International Court of Justice with the word genocide. So this is orchestrated by Qatar. And South Africa, being a failed state on the payroll of Qatar, is basically doing what its Qatari masters are telling it to do, right? This has nothing to do with genocide and justice. In fact, the same Cyril Ramaphosa uh, received, you know, hosted in South Africa uh, uh, as a hero, one of the main, uh, uh, the main perpetrators of the genocide in Sudan. So if he has a problem with genocide, how come he basically condones the perpetration of genocide in, in Sudan, because this has nothing to do with justice, with international law. It is all everything to do with radical Muslim countries and their allies using international law and international institutions to, uh, to wage their war against Israel by spreading lies and, and, uh, and defamation. So people who say genocide are lying, they know they're lying, but it's uh, just to delegitimize Israel's right to defend itself. Uh, and, and those who say don't go into Rafah, no matter what, are the same people who said after October 7, don't go into Gaza, no matter what, right? Uh, and uh, of course, as we know, after 9-11, and after the huge terrorist attacks in Europe uh, in 2011, 12, and 13, NATO forces, I'm talking about Western countries, went into Iraq, went into Syria, and fought the Islamic State in a war of self-defense. And proportionally, those Western armies made more civilian victims than Israel in Gaza. That is a fact. Now, I'm saying, of course, Israel should be judged by the same criteria as other Western countries. I don't want to be uh, judged by the same criteria as Russia, because we're not Russia and we don't want to be Russia, the same Russia that intentionally killed and bombarded civilians in Ukraine. Russia is int intentionally committing war crimes in Ukraine. Israel is behaving in Gaza, is fighting in Gaza, first of all, according to the principle of self-defense, recognized by, art by Article 51 of the UN Charter, but according to the limits of international law, every decision by the government and the army is reviewed by lawyers to check if it's if it's uh, consistent with international law. And as I said, when you look at the ratio between the military victims and the civilian victims, the ratio was much higher in Iraq and in uh, Syria when the when the NATO armies were fighting there. So obviously, this accusation is pure. Uh, a libel and uh, those who say don't go in Rafa no matter what just don't want Israel to win right now as I said it is very legitimate uh, to uh, be critical of the way Israel is conducting its operation I think that is what the um, uh, the uh, Biden administration is saying even though it might have other considerations related to the upcoming elections but in any case it is perfectly legitimate for allied countries to discuss with us how we might do things differently. But I think everybody uh, in, in America and most European countries, governments today recognize that in order for Israel to cripple Hamas's ability to retake control of Gaza, to rebuild its military power and to threaten Israel again, we need to get rid of its la last four battalions in Rafah. Now, it's as I said, uh, we uh, it's perfectly fine to discuss different ways of doing it of discussing uh, the IDF's plan to uh, displace the civilians and to protect them. But as I said, those who claim that Israel shouldn't go into Rafah at all, just say that because they don't want Israel to win. And it's not a coincidence that they're the same people uh, who spread lies and defamation with the word genocide and who took Israel to court and who keep saying, uh, you know, 
from the river to the sea and burn Tel Aviv to the ground. So the General Assembly uh, just passed a res resolution conferring uh, rights and privileges to Palestine. Could you weigh in on that, please, and let us know what role Elnet has to play uh, in this decision in any way? So this is actually the topic of our, um, you know, as I'm talking to you, I'm getting message from uh, our media people at Elnet Israel saying the briefing for tomorrow is ready. So you'll see tomorrow we're having our briefing about uh, Israel's Independence Day and the vote at the General Assembly, which uh, I recorded yesterday and which will be uh, aired tomorrow on our social media. Uh, by the way, this is an opportunity to tell our, our audience here to don't forget to, to, to follow Elnet on social media, including uh, to sign up for uh, our Telegram channel. And I, I relate to this vote at the General Assembly. Now, first of all, we have to remember when we talk about the UN and the General Assembly that you know, in my in my classes at university, when I talk about the UN, I, I always have a slide when I, I take two maps and I put them next to each other on the PowerPoint. The map of UN members, which is a majority of countries in the world, over, over 180 countries, 190. And the map next to it is the... Uh, the Economist uh, Democracy Index in the world, where they're basically uh, they grade countries by color from red to blue, according to how free and how democratic they are. And what you see when you juxtapose those maps is that a minority of countries at the UN, at the General Assembly, are, are free countries, are democracies, and a majority are autocracies. So first of all, let's start with the fact that, you know, the UN is not a club of gentlemen. It's a club where the majority, you know, it's not, it's not like in order to become a member of the UN, you don't have to pass any, any test or anything. You know, anybody, any sovereign country becomes a member of the UN unless there's a veto uh, at the Security Council. But, you know, unlike the European Union or the OECD, where you have to meet certain criteria of uh, democracy and economic development, at the UN, you know, you, you sign a you sign a, a declaration that yes, you uh, you'll support human rights and international law. And most countries that sign this declaration, uh, you know, uh, you know, they don't take it seriously. So the UN, the majority of UN members, the majority of General Assembly members, are autocracies uh, that do not respect international law and human rights. And therefore, we should remember that when we talk about the UN votes at the General Assembly. This is an assembly of autocrats, human rights violators, majority of them. And there's a lot of politics there. Let's not forget, you know, those countries exchange one another votes. You know, you'll vote for my resolution, I'll vote for yours. And of course, there you have this coalition of Muslim countries, uh, of uh, Russia and China, and they all vote together. Uh, and, and here, what we've been working on, mostly successfully at Elnet, is to tell our partners in Europe, look, the UN is, uh, it, the, the whole UN system has been uh, hijacked by autocracies. And we see it, of course, also uh, at the so-called uh, Human Rights Council, right? Where the members are uh, countries such as Sudan, Somalia, China, Saudi Arabia, Human Rights Council, right? So what we're saying to our European partners is like, at least maintain a coalition of democracies at the UN, vote together, keep the moral vote because you're surrounded by hyenas. So stay together. You know, when you have a vote at the, at the General Assembly or the Human Rights Council, all Western countries should stick together. Unfortunately, it's not always the case. I can tell you that um, the latest vote at the General Assembly, I think I've counted that um, 21 uh, European countries either voted against or abstained. Uh, so uh, two European countries voted against, that is the Czech Republic and Hungary, and 19 countries abstained. So that is not bad at all. Uh, it's about you know half of the European Union plus countries that are not members of the European Union, such as uh, the UK uh, and, uh, and, and a couple of, and Ukraine, for example, 
But what we're working on very hard in Europe today is to tell our partners, we know that the UN is a lost cause, uh, but at least save the honor of the free world by sticking together and not voting uh, with autocracies that have hijacked the UN with their automatic majority. Okay, um, just again, want to remind anybody, if you've got some questions, we're going to turn it over in just a moment. We do have a few in the, in the queue. Before we jump to questions, um, I want to offer a couple of remarks as a transition. You know, had Elmet not been working behind the scenes for 15 years diligently, broadening and deepening relationships between Israel and the majority of European nations, Israel might have been standing very alone these last seven months. And given what we've seen over the last week or two, we could almost say very alone. Um, for those of you who recognize how important Elnet's work has been and have so supported us thus far, thank you. You are the reasons that European nations are standing with Israel. And you are the reasons why the silent majority is loud and getting louder. You cannot create Elnet at the time you need it most. And if these last seven months haven't shown, we're at a point now going forward where Elnet will be needed more than ever. The coordination between Israel and European nations are never going to be more important, not only to the protection or for the protection of Israel and Europe, but for the protection of the Western Alliance. And that includes the United States. So for those of you who are in a position to donate uh, additional or additionally uh, to Elnet, please do so. For those of you who have not yet donated to Elnet, but understand how important our work is, please contribute to our efforts, uh, become a part of this effort to, to align Israel, Europe, and the United States into what we are calling the triad for the 21st century. So with that, I would like to introduce um, uh, Chairman-elect Tom Flesch. Tom, I know you have a question that you'd like to ask Emmanuel. So <clears throat> thank you very much. And I first wanted to start with a comment uh, because most of my question that I had submitted earlier uh, has been answered. Um, but I want to first say that Dr. Navon, Emmanuel, my friend, is so articulate and is such a treasure to be able to hear your rendition of the facts and interpretation of the situation as it unfolds. And, you know, to me, I think you're always spot on. Uh, your, you. your your work on uh, the diplomatic history of Israel, I think, is unique and uh, has not been uh, done in such a fashion by anyone else up until now. And I urge all the listeners today, if you have not read it, to pick up a copy and, and read it because it's an extraordinary uh, piece of work. So, Emmanuel, thank you so much for thank all you. you. Thank you. It's a privilege to have you on board and your leadership. You. Um, Mark, I just want to add to what you're saying. Uh, I personally have been always inspired daily about the work and the accomplishments that Elnet is able to achieve. But when we saw that missile attack from Iran and we saw who were the friends of Israel that the British were sending from their ships anti-missile. Then we saw the Saudis and Jordan, and we saw all the European countries, Germany, France. It was like, it's not a silent uh, minority, a silent majority. It's not so silent. There was, this came out, there was no cover. There was not behind the scenes. It was blatant up front showing defense and support for Israel. And so that I say, thank God for Elmet. And again, Mark, I, I want to say to you, I cannot emphasize enough like what you just said about supporting Elnet's work. We're out in the forefront. Our network is throughout Europe, and it's uh, it's unrivaled with anyone else. And our work is very, very important. And again, I'm saying it's evidenced by what actually happened. This is not just words. It actually happened. You saw it on your screens. You saw the, the British ships. You saw the different allies of Israel standing up and defending Israel and freedom and democracy. So um, please, everybody listening, encourage your friends to not only tune in on Monday morning briefings, and we're happy to accommodate everybody, but your support is essential. We're doing this work. It is being done. 
And I want to say again, thank you to everybody in the network that's doing what they're doing. And we have proof positive that we are effective. So thank you so much. And my questions, you know, my last part of the question is really what more can we do with LNET and Dr. Navon? What more can we do? What more can we do with LNET to have more influence on the European support and actually world support? Because it's contagious. When the news, when we have always negative things, to see something positive, it's contagious to see that people are actually stepping up. And it's not this stuff that's going on at the college campuses. And it's not this stuff that's always on the news or the thing about what Israel is doing so wrongfully. And, and so thank you and all your support, everybody who wants to support, we encourage you to do so. And if you can just comment more on what else we think you can do. Oh, Manuel, the question I always ask you too is that you're doing so much and it all filters through our Israeli office. Are you able, do you have the capacity? Can we help by enlarging the capacity? What else can we do to make sure that we continue the good work that's going on? That's so first point. of all, thank you. Thank you, Tom, uh, for your comments. And uh, and first of all, I would also like to uh, add, and I totally agree with you that it was very appropriate to remind what happened, to remind everybody what happened with the Iranian attack on Israel, because of course, this was a coalition uh, of Israel, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, France, uh, and of course, uh, also Jordan, but uh, you, you see that in this list, you only have Western countries. Obviously, neither the Russians nor the Chinese were on board. On the contrary, they support Iran. It's very clear today that in today's world, you have a very clear divide between Western democracies and autocracies that are trying together to undermine the US-led order that was built after so many sacrifices and efforts after World War II and the end of the Cold War. And Israel's allies today against Iran, because the war that we have in Gaza today is basic, basically a war against between Israel and Iran. Israel's only possible allies are in the West. And that is, of course, the center is the United States, but it's also Europe. Europe is very important for many reasons. Don't forget that Germany is the third biggest economy in the world. The third biggest economy in the world after the United States and China. It is the second supplier of weapons to Israel after America. It is Israel's strongest support at the UN and, and international organizations. The UK and France are two permanent members of the Security Council with a veto power, with nuclear weapons, with the two largest armies in NATO, and with a military presence in the East Med and the Middle East. So we need those countries on our side. And that is why we're working very hard at LNET to make sure that this uh, continues. And I think that when you ask them what, what else we can do, uh, you know, of course, today, as you know, we have an, a very strong network in Europe of six offices that operate uh, in the main countries. But of course, the more offices we have in Europe, uh, the more staff we have, the more work we'll be able to do. I mean, today, I think it's pretty amazing that with a you know pretty small organization, because at the end of the day, when you look at it, I mean, we have at our office in, in Israel, we have 10 people. Most offices in Europe have between two and five people. We bring 30 delegations every year to Israel of about 15 to 20 parliamentarians. It is a huge operation. Uh, and I think that, you know, if we could do more, uh, that would be great because the more we do, the more influence uh, we have. And as I said before, I think it's very important that we open an office in Italy this year because Italy is a very important country also in Europe. Uh, the current Italian government is very uh, pro-Israel, but we are we feel really at LNET privileged to be able to do that work, and and we very much appreciate your support. Yeah, wonderful, uh, great points, Tom. And I'm going to add, a, even if possible, a slightly finer point on that very well made point. What we saw. Um, in the in the coordinated response to Iran's attack was magnificent precision. It was almost like a ballet. It was so well coordinated. That doesn't happen overnight. Um, that is a lot of work, a lot of diplomacy, a lot of behind the scenes uh, coordination. And LNET was a large part of, of that, that response and it was magnificent. Um, so just well done to everybody. I have an interesting question. I think it would be an interesting closing question from Zafi Pekin. Um, the question is, and I'm going to sort of paraphrase this, 
if we look at polls, 70 percent of Gazans still appear to support Hamas, let's say 50 to 70, depending on the polls. A large percentage of those in the West Bank support Hamas. A lot of pain is taken to separate Hamas from Palestinians, as though Hamas doesn't actually represent the will of the Palestinians. How do how should we have that conversation about Hamas, Palestinians, the relationship? Um, and how do we provide or bring some nuance to that conversation? Because we know it's not black and white. Uh, it's actually pretty black and white. Uh, over two thirds of Palestinians support Hamas, according to all polls. And uh, the last time there were elections in the Palestinian Authority in 2006, Hamas won the election. So it's pretty black and white. There is a wide, very wide support for Hamas among the Palestinians. And whoever is trying to say the opposite uh, is ignoring the facts. I mean, this is a fact. And the civilian population in Gaza actively took, took part in October 7 after uh, the uh, after the uh, fence was breached, civilians came in to steal, to kill, and to take hostages because there was a price of a few thousand dollars for every hostage. So civilians were encouraged by Hamas to get into uh, Israel to, to take hostages and get their check. Uh, and uh, we all remember the images of joy and celebration in Gaza uh, when uh, October 7 was announced, where people were celebrating. Uh, so trying to say that, you know, the civilian population has absolutely nothing to do with Hamas is factually wrong. I mean, Hamas won an election, uh, is still supported by about two thirds of the population, both in the West Bank and in Gaza, according to all polls. And so the only way to respond to those uh, claims is simply by quoting the facts and those facts of course are not very encouraging because uh, of course we won't have time today to talk about the day after and what we're planning after the war but one of the reasons why there's no easy answer to that question is that at the end of the day we have here an organization that would not have been able to establish itself uh, without a very wide popular support among the population and that is very sad indeed Okay. Um, well, there are no more questions. I think that was uh, an impactful response. And um, thank you, Emmanuel. I know thank it's uh, Independence Day for you. I'm sure there are, it's the conclusion of it. I'm sure there's some celebratory options for you to attend. Everybody on this call, thank you for joining us today. Uh, feel free to reach out to the, uh, uh, Sari, Sia, or myself. If you're in our regions, we'd love to have conversations. And thank you all for your support and joining us here today. Thank you Bye -bye. very much.